it's Karen at the Cool Tool Studio. Today I'm going to be demonstrating a method for applying enamel to a three-dimensional form in this enameled frog pin project video. Here's what you'll need for the clay working portion of this project. I have a clay board, Art Deco Shell's texture tile, a snake maker, a tough card, a clay shaper, a two millimeter drill bit, a scatter pin and clutch, and a ribbit antique mold. I have some cool slip, sanding pads, FS999 fine silver clay, diamond needle files, and a scalpel. So I have 10 grams of fine silver clay here, and that's going to be plenty for this project. I like to start off by setting it in the antique mold itself, and then this is just a personal preference, but I find that I have a hard time, even when I do use cool slip, getting the clay to not stick to the snake maker. So I'm going to prep my tough card with some cool slip. That was plenty, so I'm going to steal some of that and put it on my texture tile for later. And I'm going to take my tough card, set it down on top, and then take my snake maker and press straight down. Kind of lean forward, back to the sides to make sure that I'm applying pressure everywhere and really getting that clay into the mold. So now this really easily comes off. And then I'm going to take my texture tile clay side down on the texture tile. I'm going to grab my snake maker again and press from the back here. Nice and even straight down this time to apply texture to the back of my piece. So now I actually find that I have the best luck um, not getting distortion in my shapes and having a nice clean shape by just allowing my clay to dry in the mold and then trimming off the excess clay when it's dry. So we're gonna allow this to dry. So I allowed this to dry on my hot plate for about five minutes or so, and it's not bone dry by any means, but it should pop out easily. And at this point, I'm gonna use a scalpel to cut out the general shape. And again, I just did this because sometimes I find that when I'm trying to pull the clay immediately out from the mold before having dried it at all, Sometimes I kind of accidentally smash one side or ruin the impression. So I just give it a little bit of time to set up. So I'm using my scalpel here. Since it's a little more dry, the clay pick um, doesn't cut as sharply as I would like. So I switched over to a scalpel for this. And I'm just kind of following the edges of the form. And once this is cut out, I will allow it to completely dry, and then I'll come back in and file and sand the shape. So at this point, we're just getting a general outline. And all of this clay won't be wasted. You can take all this outside lip and reconstitute it for another project. So again, I'm just kind of going in between these little toes here, following the general shape. And we'll catch back up once I've cut this out and allowed it to dry completely. So my frog is now completely dry. Uh, before, if I kind of would have moved his leg, it would have wiggled a little bit, but we're bone dry now. So we're ready to file and sand him. And I have some of these little diamond needle files and I really like these for getting into kind of small areas such as the little gap here. Um, this one is really nice in that it has a dome on one side and a flat on the other. So the dome side kind of naturally follows this little shape on the inside of his leg. And again, just like always when you're sanding or filing, make sure you're supporting your piece. I'm not holding him back here while I'm pushing against this. I'm kind of supporting around where I'm filing. And that's just gonna help me minimize the chance of breaking anything. So then there's this guy that's just kind of pointed and he's really good for in between the teeny tiny toes. And just kind of spend your, some time here defining the shape of the frog. And once you're happy with the shape of it, you can come in with sanding pads. I really like the sanding pads because you can kind of cut them, have a little beveled edge there to help you get into thinner spots like in between the toes here. So just spend some time 
really defining the shape of this frog and cleaning up your cut edges. That way, once it's fired, it'll be nice and shiny. After you've finished refining the edges, I like to come in with a micro fine sanding pad and just really quickly glance over this top surface. And I'm not trying to remove any detail here or anything. I'm just giving it a quick sanding and I think that kind of helps compress the material a little bit and helps things really come up to a nice shine when it's fired. So I'm happy with the side of my frog. Now we're gonna flip them over and we're going to attach the tie tack. And to do so, we're gonna use a drill bit to cut a seat. That way this tie hack is really nice and securely joined and not just setting on top of it. So I have a two millimeter drill bit here and I'm looking for about center of my frog. And I'm just gonna twist to cut myself a little seat. Tiny bit deeper. And then I'm gonna grab my tie tack, try it out for size, and that sets nicely in there. So I just have some water over here. I'm just gonna dip my tie tack directly in. You could use a brush if you would like. And I'm gonna set it in. So at this point, there's nothing it's really gonna hold it in place. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of fine silver clay here and a clay shaper and grab some clay. You could use paste or syringe, but I find that this fine silver formula is so soft that I don't really need to do so. And I'm just gonna place it off to the side there and then come in and kind of press down. Once you press down, you're gonna take the clay shaper and kind of drag off to the side a little bit. And I really didn't use much clay there. And kind of press up to remove any excess. And this is just giving you some material to hold that tie tack in place. Get it out of the texture there and so kind of put some in. Looks like I need a little more over here. And this is a little bit fussy, but I find that this is preferable to having to solder on a tie tack, especially when you're gonna be putting this piece in and out of the kiln later while you're enameling it. You won't have to worry about your solder melting on you and your tie tack falling off. All right, so once there's enough clay to hold your piece in place, I'm gonna pick it up and I'm gonna look at it from all angles because it might look good from this side, but it might be leaning that way. So I'm gonna look at it from this direction. It looks nice and straight. This direction, we look good. So now that I'm happy with the placement, I'm gonna take kind of the pointed edge of this and go back through my texture to remove any extra clay. I kind of filled the low areas there. And then I'm gonna allow this to dry and then just come in with the sanding pad once it has dried and smooth up that surface a tiny bit. So I'm just wrapping up sanding that connection point there and my piece is ready to fire. I'm gonna fire my frog on its back with support in a kiln at 1650 for two hours. Once your piece is fired, you're gonna to wanna to bring it up to a nice high polish. I did so by placing my piece in the tumbler for about half an hour um, if you don't have a tumbler, you can spend some time with rotary tools on the flux shaft or really get in there with fine emery paper. You want your piece to be really shiny. That way the enamel really takes on a nice gem-like effect when fused. So you can also see here that tie tack is nice and secure in my piece. And again, that's really nice that we did it before firing. That way we're not going to have to worry about solder flowing while we're enameling or anything like that. So we're ready to go. And I have here some washed transparent enamel. I'm working with Peacock. And when I say washed, um, some people call it sized as well. It just means removing the smaller particles. And 
I like to do that in these containers by pouring myself some enamel, adding some water, swirling and dumping off the top. Um, the weight of the larger pieces allows them to stay down to the bottom of your jar. And then anything you pour off, you can allow to dry and use for counter enamel on another project. So I've got nice large grains of enamel here, and those are the most transparent. And that's what we want on this piece. I have some clear fire here, um, but I like to take my clear fire and put it in a container and leave it with the lid off, whoops, and spill it apparently, um, and allow it to dry. And I just let it dry out some, and that kind of increases the viscosity. Um, I like to work with it a little bit better that way. So you can see it's got a little more tack and stick to it than it would straight out of the bottle. It's not dripping off my brush. And that's gonna make it really good for packing and clinging to this dimensional form. I just have a dish of water here to add to the enamel as well to thin things out if they get a little thick. So I've got my frog and I'm going to be mixing the clear fire into my enamel directly. And there are plenty of ways you can go about enameling on dimensional forms. You can apply clear fire to the piece and sift, but I think this is just a really fun approachable way, especially if you wanna add multiple colors. Um, it just gives you a lot of creative liberty and control. So I'm mixing the clear fire in with the enamel, and then I just like to pick it up with my brush. And I'm placing it on my piece, and then I just kind of use the brush and pull the enamel across the surface. And you don't want it to be too thick, you just want it to be covered and not really be able to see the silver through it at this point. Um, you can always add additional coats, so I encourage you to be thin on your first coat you can always come back and add more, but it is really difficult to take enamel off. And if your enamel is too thick, you're gonna kind of lose the luminosity of the silver underneath the enamel. So again, I'm just kind of pulling it across the piece. And sometimes I find once the enamel is placed, if you're like, ooh, it's kind of thick over here, if you were to touch it and it's dried, it'll just flake off. So that's when you'd come in with the water, dampen your brush, and this is still damp, um, so it wouldn't fall off on me, but just to show you what I mean, you can come in with a damp brush and kind of scoot the particles about. So again, this is a really beginner-friendly way with a lot of control to add enamel to dimensional pieces. Um, you wanna make sure you're kind of rotating your piece so you can really get to the sides there. And just as a side note, when you're applying enamel or really doing anything that kind of requires control, it's much easier to control where your enamel is going when your brush and your hand is braced. So if I'm just floating my arm here and trying to come in, it's really hard to control where my brush is going. Things are kind of shaky. But by adding my finger here, I've got a kind of joint of support. And it's much easier to Make sure your enamel's going where you want it. You've got some stability to your brush hand there. I'm gonna get those tiny toes and just try to go for a nice even application. Again, if you like really blob it on, like say, whoops, there's a big, bigger than I would like piece of enamel there, or I guess spot of several enamels there. You can dampen your brush and kind of spread that around and distribute it. So we're gonna catch back up once I've got a nice coat of enamel on this frog and we'll talk about firing. So I've mostly laid down a coat of enamel here, um, but as you kind of rotate the piece, you can see that there are some points where the silver is shining through so that's where I was talking about earlier. You can come in with a slightly damp brush and just kind of scoot the particles around. Right there, there's a little bare spot. Don't want too much water, just a tiny bit. And you can cover those little bare spots. So just make sure that you're happy with this first coat. Again, you can always add some more. 
and do a second firing of enamel, but you just want to make sure that all the areas are covered and you're happy with the surface. So there are some spots that are thinner, some spots that are thicker than others. Um, the enamel is going to kind of naturally pull in low areas, so you can kind of come back through and pull from there, and then just kind of even that out with your dampened brush. You want to make sure that your piece is completely dried before you put it in the kiln for the enamel to fuse. If you put it in damp, the moisture in, that you used alongside your enamel to apply it is going to quickly evaporate and the piece, the enamel is going to kind of chip off and fly off in little pieces before it fuses. So allow your piece to dry. Um, you can speed that up by placing it on your trivet on top of your kiln, um, but you want to make sure it's thoroughly dry before you fire it. I'm going to be firing this piece in a kiln that's set to 1450. And if you have a window, uh, that's great. You can just watch for the enamel to fuse and kind of gloss over and then let it go a little bit longer. That way it gets nice and bright and shiny. If you pull it out too early, um, the enamel won't really be fully transparent, but you can always pop it back in. Um, if you don't have a window, um, when you open the kiln to put your piece in, the temperature is going to drop. I just kind of watch the numbers and look for them to come all the way back up to 1450. By then, usually your enamel has fused. So I pulled this piece out of the kiln right when the kiln got back up to 1450, and I'm really happy with my first coat. Um, you can still see the silver shining through, and at this point you could decide, I like the way that this looks. Um, if you wanted to add another coat, um, you can develop a kind of a slightly more rich green, um, so it's up to you at this point. Uh, if you were to add another coat, you can pack it just as you did the first. Um, the enamel will apply to the fused layer of enamel just as it did the silver. So again, just kind of applying some and then using the brush to drag it over your piece. Um, but I think for this video, I'm pretty happy with the way that this looks. So I'm going to wipe that off. And again, this is peacock ring and um, I think it's lovely on silver. Make sure that before you pick your colors, you do a sample because there are some colors that definitely fire better over silver than others. So do a little test strip if you're not going to be working with peacock green. So once you're happy with the enamel on your piece, um, if you would like, this is just kind of an extra step that I'm adding to really help the texture on the back of this piece pop. You can um, use some sort of patina to oxidize it. And I'm going to be working with Black Max. Um, I really like this product. It gives a nice flat black um, very quickly, but it is an acid, so make sure you're wearing gloves. Um, work in a ventilated space and avoid inhaling the vapor. I've got an old brush here and really just a tiny bit goes a long, long, long way. Um, and I'm just going to brush it across my surface and it's going to immediately darken this piece. And again, protect yourself with gloves. Um, also, on the offhand chance that someone's going to make it towards your eyes, you should be wearing goggles or some sort of safety glasses, eye protection. And you can use a Q-tip to apply this as well if you don't have an old brush that you don't care about lying around. Um, you're just again kind of painting it on and letting it work its magic. All right. So then um, I'm going to use one of these sanding blocks to remove it from the high areas. You can see I had a little stray piece of enamel there that made its way to the back of my piece. Um, when you go to fire these, frogs, make sure you check the back of your pieces for stray bits of enamel if something like that would bother you. I should have given the look-see, but I was so caught up in making sure that front surface looked good. Alright, so at this point the oxidization has been removed from the high points and you can really see that pattern. And I'm just going to come in with this flash shiner 
to bring it back up to a polish. I love these little tools. Um, if you don't want to tumble something or if something's tarnished, they're just a really great way to very quickly bring it back up to a nice finish. So you start with the green side and then flip it over and use the white side to really make this piece shine. All right, so there you have your finished piece. So the scatter pin that I embedded into this piece, um, you can purchase a corresponding clutch for, and they just go down on and kind of click on, and then you can press these two tabs to pull it off. And I think these are a really great and simple way to add a pin back to a piece. I hope this project served as a good overview for applying enamel to a dimensional piece. You could do any shape that you'd like. It doesn't necessarily have to be a frog, and there are plenty of ways that you can make your frog your own. Maybe you decide this looks like a poison dart frog, and you enamel it blue instead. You could also come back in with underlying black, or foil, or mica powder, to kind of add little accents and elements to your frogs to make them your own. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration on how you can wet pack enamel onto a three-dimensional form. If you're wanting to use multiple colors in one layer, or just aren't a fan of sifting enamel, this is a great method for applying enamel to a 3D form. It's a great beginner technique as well, so I hope you feel like you can give it a try. Thanks for watching.